if you just uh, bear with me for a few moments, I just want to give you a little tiny bit of background um, that's led to the work I'm going to show you today. Around about 25 years ago, I read this extraordinary book, um, a novel by Calvino, Italo Calvino, uh, the Italian author called Invisible Cities. And some of you will have read this book. Um, I reread it about five or six, I guess, uh, maybe six years ago. And what I remembered of the novel, which is essentially uh, maybe about 40, 50 very, very short chapters. Uh, each chapter is only about one or two pages. And in these chapters, Calvino imagines conversations taking place around about the year 1290 between Marco Polo, the Venetian explorer, and Kublai Khan, who was the Tartar emperor at the time. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, it was the largest empire in the world at the time. So he's sending Marco Polo out to the cities, uh, various cities in the empire from time to time. And then Marco comes back, sits around the fireside with the emperor, and the emperor says, uh, Kublai Khan, Marco, please tell me about the city in my empire that you've just been to. Um, so the description of these cities in the hands of Calvino, the author, are fabulously poetic and uh, uh, philosophic. In one city, there's a man in a barber shop having his throat shaved like this, but an exact mirror image of this is taking place underground. In fact, the entire city exists underground as a mirror image of the city above ground. So for the emperor, all of these cities are cities in the mind, cities in the mind. Uh, in 2006, the Arts Council of England gave me money to try to make um, a portrait of London, as if it was a city that I'd never been to with my body, but I had with my mind. In other words, as if it was a city in the mind. I started in 2006, uh, as this suggests, shooting film. And I worked for about two years, and uh, I stopped. I was absolutely stopped in my tracks because I'd reached the end of the road shooting film. So I want to show you some of the pictures which I made shooting film during those two years, which I'm never going to use. This was an incredibly important photograph in the series at this time, because I was beginning to experiment, even though I was shooting film, I was beginning to experiment with scanning and making pigment prints. Well, in fact, they were HP pigment prints. And this purple, I think it might be a cabbage, at least people in the audience know exactly what it is. I, I, I'm thinking of it as a purple cabbage. In the print, in the, in the Hewlett Packard print I made, the color in the cabbage was a color that I'd never seen in 35 years of printing color before. And that made that discovery immensely exciting. So at this point, I'm starting to uh, think about digital prints when I'm shooting film and continuing to shoot film with these pictures. I think part of the difficulty with uh, this approach at the time was that I was, I think I was thinking of trying to make a portrait of London. And I hadn't quite got my head around the idea that to make a portrait of London is pretty much impossible, unless you're a genius like Peter Ackroyd. Um, because the city has a history which is so immense, it's so multi-layered, that it just, it just didn't seem to be possible. After a while, I could see that I'd set myself a challenge, which was essentially impossible. And I guess to a certain extent, that was leading me inexorably towards this position uh, in 2008, when I stopped shooting with film. I think one of the things that I was noticing was that in these pigment prints made from scans from film, I was seeing colors and particular kinds of intensity, and not only intensity of color, that was making me think that something very, very important had happened in the world of photography. And I wanted to be much more closely involved with it. And I think probably around about the middle of 2008, I just completely hit this brick wall. And I stopped shooting, and I worked out what size of digital 
taping print I wanted to make, <coughs> waited for the right camera to come out, and unfortunately, as luck would have it, I only had to wait a couple of months. I bought this uh, Nikon digital camera, and I made the discovery that I kind of expected or hoped that I would make. In other words, we've, we've been talking about scans of, uh, of negatives uh, this morning so far, and making digital prints from scans from negatives. But the whole point about negatives is that they were never meant to be scanned. So scanners and scanning has been a, a really ingenious response to the issue of how to make these new digital prints from film stock. But what I hoped would happen when I bought a digital camera was exactly what did happen. Because of course a digital camera is a device that is actually designed from the ground up to reproduce the visible world, <coughs> generating a digital file uh, without any, any uh, interference, without any mediation. So that the smoothness of color, the kind of colors I was getting, and other qualities which, for example, the curator of photography of the VNA recently described as a very particular liquidity in the prints, in the images, was something which I immediately got incredibly excited about. And I don't know whether you can tell, but there's quite a big jump, considering that I just restarted making uh, work in London, so really the same project, but with a different approach. And I imagine that you can see a difference in the work. Now, I'm only going to show you about 16 of these uh, images uh, from the new series today. And I may seem mean, and I do apologize, but I've got another two or three years to shoot. Um, so I'd, I'd like to keep a little bit back uh, so that uh, when the book and the exhibition comes out, uh, there's a little bit of a surprise. But it was remarkable making, making this change. And, the amount of excitement I felt um, being able to shoot digitally and saying to myself, film and me are gone, it's the past. You know, I spent 35 years working in darkroom shooting film with all of the paraphernalia and the bad smells and chemicals and all that kind of stuff and I'm just not really, I'm really not interested. Um, and the other thing is, it's kind of connected, that when I was at school uh, doing my A-levels, I did science subjects. And when I left uh, school in, in Wales, uh, in Cardiff, I went to study civil engineering, which of course is very technical. I mean, it didn't work out because I wanted to be a photographer. I'd gone to see the careers officer in 1971 or whatever it was, and he said, Peter, there is one day you're barely already. We don't need another one. And it wasn't, it wasn't exactly what I wanted to be. But... So I kind of got distracted for three months um, with civil engineering. But I think that sort of background has made it very, very easy for me to be, to feel completely at home with computers. I absolutely love working with computers. And it has been a very, very steep learning curve. I mean, it took a whole year to work out how to use uh, Photoshop properly. And um, I'm, I'm also using Photoshop, as, as Mark was kind of uh, alluding to, as a tool to work, just to open up the images and to get to prepare them um, and you know, put them in a form so that they can be printed and the best can be drawn out of them. But the last thing I'm doing is sort of putting things into the images which weren't there when I made the pictures. <coughs> so what really excites me about this work, uh, in addition to what I've already outlined, is the idea that I'm making work in a city, the city of London, but the city that these photographs in the book and the exhibition will allude to will not be a city you can visit. It'll be a city in the mind. You won't be able to take a train or a bus to this city. And another very, very interesting aspect of, uh, of these new prints, I think, is there is this whole issue, which is which it's beginning to be discussed, but you know we are in uh, the infant stages of this discussion. <coughs> Namely, we're shooting digital files. I'm shooting digital files. The, the, the mechanisms, the software programs to read these digital files are changing, but they're changing not too quickly at the moment. But the world color expert, Henry Wilhelm, at least um, I, I see him, I understand he's a world color expert, on the aging of two-dimensional color materials in the States, he reckons that these new Hewlett Hilo Packard prints, and I'm using Hewlett Packard uh, materials, are going to be stable for at least 250 years. Well, of course, we're not going to be around in 250 years. 
Um, but a lot of museums are starting to pay a great deal of attention, collectors, to the idea, the concept of these prints having that longevity. But the thing is, in 50 years, the software program for reading the files that we're shooting our cameras is almost certainly going to be very, very different indeed. And it seems to me possible that in 50, 100 years from now, we may only have these prints if they've been very, very carefully looked after as evidence of the original photographer's vision. And what that means for me is that it's a, in a sense the wheel is coming full circle. If you go back 100 years, print was fantastically important, 50 years even. Um, and now we have a situation where right up until the print stage, you have a virtual image. It's just zeros and ones. The only manifestation physically of the photographer's ideas is in the pigment print. And surely this idea that the files may not be readable in the future, or they may uh, disintegrate or you know, um, degrade, and you may be left with the print. And that seems to me to, to mean that the wheel has come right around, focusing attention on the importance and the validity of a very beautiful crafted image. I must admit, I'm still at the stage of seeing some of the prints come off the printer, uh, and my wife is very, very um, tolerant. Um, one third of our lounge is a digital printing studio now. Mark was talking about, you know, working on his bedroom. And uh, I gave up my studio in Hackney um, some time ago, you know, it's a lot of space and expensive and full of stuff which I found, you know, I just didn't need anymore. And I really love, I love this way of working. Um, which means that things are, you just need a 13 hour PowerPoint. You don't even need darkness. So I'm afraid those are the only pictures I've got to show you today. And um, I'll thank you for your attention.